to fly like a bird, to enter a new element and look down on the earth like a god. It has been the dream of man since he first looked upward. That dream was made real at the turn of the century. Two brothers from Ohio became the first of a brotherhood of inventors and pioneers who broke the shackles of gravity and reached for the skies. This is the Starship, built 85 years after the romance of powered flight began. It is the latest in a long line of pioneering aircraft that have shrunk man's world and brought the stars within his reach. All of this has taken place within a man's lifetime, since the adventure began here on the sands of Kitty Hawk in North Carolina in 1903. How did man learn to fly? It's carved in granite on top of that big hill. It reads like this. In commemoration of the conquest of the air by the brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright, conceived by genius, achieved by dauntless resolution and unconquerable faith because man will never fly. One and one half million years of scratching into the sky stop at that rock. Man flew. Orville and Wilbur Wright were bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio, builders, practical men. But they were fired by the curiosity and the passion to fly. First, they studied the mechanics of bird flight. Then they experimented with kites and gliders. And finally, they brought their theories here to Kitty Hall. It was a dream, a dream shared today by Ken Kellett, who has spent years building an exact replica using the same material of linen, wire, and wood. A dream to be flung into the wind and asked to rise. It's a staggering achievement. It's something that most people just can't grasp. They can't grasp what it would be like to get into an airplane, the first airplane in this case, and get that 750 pounds off the ground and even remotely begin to control it and fly it down the field. We've come a long way. It's kind of hard to imagine, you know, 66 years between this airplane and walking on the moon. They really understood the forces in the airplane their choices of woods and triangles being the strongest geometric form. And if you look, there's just triangles are created everywhere in the airplane. If it's not created by a wire, it's created by a strap. And if it's not created by a strap, then it's created by three pieces of wood. How about coming over here and checking these elevators, see how they work? OK, that right there. That's about right. Yeah, yeah. It's smooth enough, but that cable's too loose. It's not working quite right as long as that uh, on the chain. Yeah. Everything up there looks good. Yeah, there's nothing about that cable. Maybe right we here. Stick a, yeah, we stick a turnbuckle in there. And pull that up and make yeah. that tighter. We aren't just born knowing how to fly. 
And the Wrights realized that you had to actually learn to control an airplane before you could ever even dream of getting in it. Others had failed. Some had died in the attempt. But the Wrights had understood that if they were to succeed and survive, they would have to control their flyer in three dimensions. They invented a system which would flex its wings like a bird. They called it wing warping. The Wrights came here to Kitty Hawk for the wind conditions. It's about 500 miles from Dayton to this barrier island. From there, they had to offload at the village of Kitty Hawk. And uh, things had to be put on wagons and then taken to the site where they were at. You have to remember, the airplane didn't come assembled. It came in pieces. Everything was in a barrel or a box. They had some propeller shafts that failed. Orville ends up having to get on a train and go back to Dayton and make new shafts and come back. Everything the Wrights used, they had to make themselves, even the engine. None existed that was light enough and powerful enough to do the job they needed. So in a foundry in Dayton, they built their own. Put yourself in a situation where you've never seen an airplane, you've never read about an airplane, and here's this machine sitting there, and you're put into it and told to go fly it around. That's really quite frightening. I think that the bravery is never really addressed with these two. It's a large mass pivoting around you. It's complicated, and it's difficult, and it's scary. At 10.30 on December 17th, 1903, Orville Wright entered a new world. Twelve seconds and 90 yards of flight that changed the history of the 20th century. At first, the Wrights were simply not believed. However, little by little, they refined their machine. And two years later, the Wrights were flying 25 miles at a stretch. They were still the only people in the world who possessed a practical powered aircraft. Until that time, Europe had been the leader in the race towards the sky. But efforts there, in France especially, had concentrated on airships like that of the Brazilian Albert Santos Dumont, who caused a storm of excitement by flying his airship over Paris. But Europeans were still a long way from their first real aeroplane. It wasn't until 1906, a year after the Wrights had flown 25 miles, that Santos Dumont took Europe's first 60-yard hop in his extraordinary 14 Bs. Among those watching was Louis Blériot, the Frenchman, who three years later was to catch the imagination of the world. On a blustery morning in July 1909, he pointed his plane towards the seaway which divides Britain from France, the English Channel, chasing a 1,000-pound prize. It was a dangerous gamble, 
But 36 and a half minutes later, he landed his plane in England to the delight of his compatriots. In just over half an hour, he'd become aviation's first star. His flight had been a catalyst for a new explosion of interest in man's newest adventure. People went out to buy planes, they thronged to air meets. A new figure, the pilot hero, had been born. It wasn't long before the shape of aircraft began to conform to a standard. Engine at the front, wings in the middle, tail behind. Typical of the planes of the period is the British Avro triplane, built by A.V. Rowe in 1909. It's a masterpiece of design, elegant and practical. In the triplane, the controls have been refined into a system whose principles are with us still, though it retains the Wright brothers' old technique of wing warping. Control set. Set. Contact. Contact both. It was aeroplanes like this that introduced man to the sheer exhilaration of flight. After the triplane came the legendary Avro 504. It was tougher and more solid than the triplane, with only two wings and more effective controls. It was a winner. Nearly 9,000 of these planes were built between 1913 and 1931, when it finally went out of service. It was a two-seater and turned out to be an ideal training aeroplane. And it had a revolutionary engine that cooled itself by rotating along with the propeller. Ready to start? Ready to start. Set. Contact. Contact. With the arrival of the 504, aviation became a science. The plane, unlike earlier aircraft, was entirely predictable. It would do what it was asked to do.
new flyers drawn to the skies could learn from it the principles of flight. World War I pilot Willem Lewis remembers. The Avro was an absolutely superior, super aircraft. It flew well, but was highly sensitive. Mistakes showed up so clearly, but they didn't run you into a spin or a crash or anything like that. They could be rectified. So it was a good training aircraft. You had to fly correctly to fly it well. So much so that when Smith Barry started his superior flying school for qualified, sometimes expert pilots, he used the Avro. Smith Barry took up the idea that most pilots were not flying perfectly, they're losing height on turns and things like that. And this he corrected. It was a very interesting school. Smith Barry's school was at Gosport in the south of England, and its principles, largely worked out on the Avro 504, remain the basis of flying training even today. In the days of the early pioneers, the novice pilot had to train on the wing of the prayer. Now he had a syllabus to follow. Streamlined training became even more important during the First World War. Pilots were now in huge demand. 26,000 were trained by the British Royal Flying Corps alone. So at the war's end, there was an enormous surplus of trained pilots and cheap planes. One result was show business. At the same time, along came the new airmail service, which brought together into one vast correspondence huge tracts of land like the United States. And now was the age of the trailblazers, who set out to find long-distance routes across the world. Alan Cobble flew the length of Africa. We had flown up from the blistering heat of the Sudan to Uganda. I was called Bwana Makubwa Ya Indege, the great master of the bird. Then in 1927 came the most famous trailblazer of them all. A bashful 25-year-old flyer climbed into a monoplane called the Spirit of St. Louis. From a New York airport, he took off into the darkness on the first solo flight across the Atlantic. 33 and a half hours later, Charles Lindbergh landed in France to become overnight the most famous man on earth. He had succeeded in shrinking the gap between Europe and America. Then he returned to America and in New York received the most stupendous welcome of them all. Lucky Lindy, they called him then. Planes were getting bigger. You no longer had to be a pilot to fly. Suddenly, you could be a passenger in a commercial aircraft. The United States, with its great distances, became the ideal place to pioneer commercial aviation. Plane from New York and the East, arriving 420 on time. The new passengers demanded comfort, and for this, the airlines demanded new aircraft. TWA called in the Donald Douglas Company, which came up after two early models with the DC-3. Chief design engineer, Arthur Raymond. You can almost tell that an airplane is going to be a good airplane or not by how it looks. This is a very beautiful airplane for the time. It was much more beautiful than the DC-2 because of that rounded fuselage. And everything was sort of a development of something before so that it looked like a finished product. You couldn't think of making it any better. The DC-3, or the Dakota, could fly farther, faster, with more passengers, in more comfort than any aircraft of the times. The first aeroplane recognizably of the modern age. We had to decide how many airplanes to build that Jig 4. We thought we'd build it for 25, 
we finally decided to build it for 50. We, of course, built over 10,000 airplanes. By the end of the 30s, this tough, graceful little workhorse was flying more passengers than any other plane. And during the Second World War, it became the Allies' most important air transport, doted on by those who flew it. I'm sure that its role during the war had a great deal to do with that. So many service pilots had flown through so many difficult conditions with it. They began to have an affection for something that brought them through alive. General Eisenhower said that the DC-3 was one of the three things that helped win the war. It became a legend for its endurance. In 1950, a DC-3 was abandoned on a glacier in Iceland. Eight months later, it was still there, under 15 feet of snow, when they came to salvage it. The plane was stranded. It was left there. So it was a, just about a brand new aircraft. So we thought it was a shame to leave it there. So we were thinking about maybe get it down. Of course, we had to use the caterpillars to move the snow from it. And uh, I can tell you right now, when we found the airplane, we opened the window and uh, put the master switch on, and everything lighted there. Instrument panel and even the radios, they were working. The battery was good. It was towed for 40 miles down the glacier, and then took off perfectly and flew to Reykjavik without a hitch. And today, 50 years after it was first put into service, the DC-3 is working still, here carrying passengers between Boston and Cape Cod. Proud pilot George Felton is taking off in a DC-3 that has flown more hours than any other plane on Earth. 36 uh, is the highest time aircraft in the world. It's an all-time record center. It's got 90,191 hours on it, which is well over 10 years. Enough to go around the world 550 some odd times, maybe. The landing gear is very strong on it. The engines are very strong. Uh, there's three spires that hold it in the wing. The wings are held on by 328 nuts and bolts. When you see one apart, it's built like a bridge in there with all the trusses and corrugated metal and everything. It's just built very, very strong. When I get up here in a DC-3, I just feel peaceful as serenity for me. It's just uh, nostalgic and uh, thoughts run away with you. It's amazing how many people come aboard for nostalgia it's where they met their wives or they flew to see loved ones. I found out how many people have been engaged on a DC-3. You know, there's just so many of them, they've flown so many miles and so many passengers that uh, almost anyone that, that flew past years flew at one time or another in a DC-3 and have very happy memories of it. They're so graceful, they're big and slow, sit there and make noise, but everybody loves them. They're comfortable and they get you there and they're very, very safe. I feel very proud, I really do, because there are more pilots in those big airplanes wishing they're in my position you know, I don't wish I was in there, so I really don't. But just as the DC-3 was taking the piston-engined aeroplane into its golden age, one man had already conceived the idea that would overtake it. Less than a generation after the Wright brothers, a young English air cadet named Frank Whittle was developing a new engine, the jet. I decided that in order to fly very fast and very far, one would have to go very high. I realized that the piston engine couldn't possibly work in, that th in the thin air of great heights, and the propeller wouldn't be suitable for speeds of the order of 500 miles an hour. I used this to pull in air at the front and to compress it into combustion chambers, like this, where the injection and burning of fuel heats and expands the air and gives it enough energy to drive a turbine. As a result of trying various schemes for 18 months, I ended up at the end of 1929 with the idea for the turbojet. 
In those days, not only was I up against uh, engineering design problems, but uh, there was a tremendous intellectual opposition in, in that uh, a lot of the people ha I was having to deal with, I think, felt uh, an inevitable reluctance to see all their knowledge thrown into the wastebasket. For six long years, Whittle fought to find backing for his revolutionary new idea. Finally, in 1935, he gathered a small team together to give his ideas flesh. They began work in a shed. Money was a major difficulty, too. Uh, people just weren't ready to invest in what they regarded as such a wild scheme. When we started to get going on practical work, at first, we wanted to test components separately but the quotation for compressor tests and so forth was so high that we had to go for the complete engine in one go. People had said that it wouldn't even drive itself, but how wrong they were. When I turned on that main control, the thing went out of control, the speed out of control, rising rapidly, the needle on the tachometer going like that. So I screwed down the control valve immediately. Everyone had taken to their heels, except me, and I was paralyzed with fright. And when I screwed down the valve to try and stop it, it still continued to accelerate, which seemed impossible. And then it ran down. The first perilous run of the turbo jet took place in 1937. But Whittle's problems were not over. Making an operational engine took two more years. Building an aircraft to carry it, another two. It was only with the beginning of the Second World War that official indifference ended, and his first jet aircraft, the E-2839, was readied for trial. The flight trials proper took place in May of 1941 and were completely successful. The E-28 did about 17 test flights in uh, 12 days and then continued to fly on and off throughout the war with that engine and others. I was the lucky bloke who had to demonstrate the Gloucester Whittle E2839 to Winston Churchill at Hatfield Aerodrome. We had only done level flight up to date and we were certainly not going to do any aerobatics because it was rather an important Airplane. So we decided that what we could demonstrate was speed. So we kept it at about tree height with about 400 on the clock. Winston was suitably impressed because from then onwards, a little push was given for both the vampire and the meteor. Britain's first operational jet was the twin-engined Gloucester Meteor, which came into service in 1944, too late for action against enemy fighters. By that time, the Americans were in the jet game, too. For the British had passed on the results of Whittle's work to the United States. We virtually gave the Americans the whole job, and the American government selected the General Electric to uh, build the engine, which they did very speedily. They had their first engine running in six months, and uh, just a few months later, they had several other engines, more than we had. Incredible as it may seem, these crates mark the start of the development of the first jet engine in America. Gentlemen, I give you the Whittle engine. The Americans gave an undertaking that they would only use the information for war purposes. Well, it's an extraordinary thing, but the socialist government of 1945 and 1946 and after uh, let the Americans off the hook for a total payment of $3,800,000. It wasn't too long before they uh, stole the lead in aviation. The Mojave Desert in California, the hot, flat surface of Muir Rock Dry Lake. This is Edwards Air Force Base, the home of American experimental aviation and of aeroplanes at the cutting edge of technical research, planes like the X-29. After the war, with Europe devastated, this is where the new frontiers of flying would be pushed back by some well-funded and brilliantly organized research called the X-Programme. 
Within 10 years, this program would force new aircraft through the sound barrier and on to speeds of 2,000 miles an hour. 10 years after that, it would bring them to the edge of space. The sound barrier, Mach 1, was the first challenge. Others had tried to pass through it and lost their lives in the attempt. So an experimental aircraft, the X-1, was built to confront it. Its pilot was World War II ace Chuck Yeager. The X-1 was mine because the old man said, OK, it's your program, get with it. And the only reason he picked me is because I was trained in maintenance and I understood systems and obviously could fly an airplane. We didn't look at ourselves as heroes, pioneers, or anything else. It's if we didn't do it, somebody else would. No airplane had ever flown much above 90% of the speed of sound until we got the X-1 up there. Every flight that we made, we were in a region where no one had ever had an airplane before. In fact, we didn't even have any wind tunnel data in that region. So it was every day something new. On October the 14th, 1947, a B-29 with Jaeger aboard and his X-1 slung beneath it took off. Jaeger probably shouldn't have been flying. I was hurting because I'd been in a horseback riding accident. I broke a couple ribs, hurt my shoulder a couple nights before, and uh, I wasn't feeling too good. But the point was, uh, I made the decision to fly the airplane. Came back into Bombay, got on the ladder, and and they slid the ladder down to your opposite the nose on the X-1, and you're sitting here about 12,000 feet above the ground, the wind blowing on you, you slide in feet first. That's the way you got into the X-1. Five, four, three, two, one, drop. The flight itself just went as expected. Uh, We'd been having a lot of trouble with fires in the tail of the airplane and igniters that wouldn't work. Fortunately, they all worked that day, and, uh, and we pushed the thing out. And really, uh, once we got the Mach jump on the Mach meter and all the buffeting smoothed out, and we got our first sonic boom here, then it almost was a letdown, you know, if the damn thing didn't blow up. The combat experience I had made me a very disciplined pilot, meaning that I learned to control my emotions and feelings toward the outcome. It didn't make any difference to me whether the X-1 blew into a million pieces or not. See, because I couldn't do anything about it, so I put it out of your mind. And you do that in combat. We realized that the so-called sound barrier really restricted us from going any faster. And once we got the X-1 above the speed of sound and smoked on out the Mach 2 and then beyond, you see, we realized, hey, this opens up the whole universe for us. This was pioneering on a new and lavish scale. Each aircraft at Edwards was built to test some particular aspect of research, engines, aerodynamics, even spacesuits. They were not so much prototype aircraft as flying laboratories. The X-15 was the most spectacular of them all. The aircraft that was to win for some of its pilots astronaut wings, as it carried them to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere at nearly seven times the speed of sound, over four and a half thousand miles an hour. The testing area was way up, often over 50 miles above the Earth. So the X-15 had to be suspended under a B-52 bomber and air-launched. Most flights were short, all were dangerous. One of the test pilots was Scott Crossfield. I never considered the X-15 dangerous. I knew that it was a very tight and tough program. It wasn't the goggles and scarf and the breeze uh, going out and laying your life on the line, nothing like that. I'm an engineer. We do things with deliberate uh, design and thought. Of course, there's one man in the X-15, and there were five in the B-52, and if we had trouble, they would throw away the X-15, because, of course, it's a very volatile bomb. 1,200 gallons of anhydrous ammonia and 1,000 gallons of liquid oxygen. It's coming on now. Number one, first. Right, George Hattersley. 
People would try to tell you what was going to happen or what it was going to be like, but it was a tremendous shock when you launched. You just, pow, you were dropped off. And of course, the airplane would tend to roll off, and the first thing you had to do was get the engine lit. And then all of a sudden, here I was sitting there with my head back, and I couldn't move it because of the thrust of the engine. I finally got up to the conditions where I was supposed to shut the engine off, and I told Bill Dana that this was one aircraft that I was happy to shut the engine off on. <laughs> my first flight, the X-15, I went to Mach 4, my first flight, and I'd never been above Mach 2 before that, and uh, uh, everything happened just a little bit faster than I uh, really wanted it to. It wasn't until I got down to about Mach 2 again in the traffic pattern that uh, I felt like I'd caught up with the airplane. Real good from back here. It was a wild ride, and uh, the people that got to Mach 6 in it uh, went from Mach 5 to Mach 6 in eight seconds, which is moving right on down the road. Later, as I got to go to higher altitudes, where I got more into the spectacular, you'd look down and see the bright blue ring of atmosphere, so I'd maybe see two or 300 miles, and that was kind of exciting. As you got to the higher speeds, you knew the airplane was getting very hot because all of a sudden it would pop or bang and you could feel the airplane twitch. And it turned out that this was due to panels on the aircraft actually buckling, but along with that, occasionally you'd see wisps of smoke coming up in the cockpit and you really weren't sure what was happening. I guess test pilots aren't supposed to say they're afraid, but uh, I was impressed. <laughs> You haven't got time to indulge in emotions or personal thoughts. Your total concentration is on the job at hand. And you go over in your mind everything you're going to do, because there's no time to go to a book and look up things. 20, 10, 5. I thought the rear landing gear had broken. The attitude was not that much different. I was afraid a fire was still on, so I stayed in the cockpit until the rescue people got there because I'm in a very good steel protective environment with a pressure suit on, so I could have gone through quite a fire. Ground tests at Edwards could be equally hazardous, especially when it came to testing new engines. I've always joked that the way they build pilots' confidence that he gets in the cockpit and everybody else gets in the blockhouse. This is what we did this day. It's like a graveyard out there. You don't see anybody anywhere. And we ran the engine. One of the things I had to do was shut it down after throttling it through several thrust levels and then restart it. And I restarted and it had an automatic shutdown. So I pushed the reset button and at that instant the whole thing went to sky high. It was a pretty impressive fire. It blew the cockpit about 20 feet forward, 
out to the edge of the fire, though it was quite like being in the sun. It was very bright orange. And uh, so I just shut everything down, and I was just going to sit there and wait the fire out. About 15 minutes later, the newsmen started calling. I don't know what kind of a pipeline they have, but to calm them down, I told them the only casualty was a press in my pants because the firemen had gotten me wet. And so, of course, an East Coast newspaper the next day had a headline, X-15 blows up, pilot wets pants. Then, in 1957, without warning, the Russians broke into space with the first Sputnik. And work on new aircraft was suddenly cancelled. The future of the space program was to belong not to pilots, but to astronauts and rockets. Six, nine, four, three, two, one. We made one of the gravest errors of my generation parked the whole aeronautical industry and stopped the research airplane program. And space by forfeit then went to the uh, medicine men, the missileers, and the Germans, all with their terrible disdain for pilots and wings and aeronautics about which they knew nothing. We clear the tower. These people didn't understand the reliability that went with man-rated systems because everything they ever made, if it worked, they never saw it again. And if it didn't work, they never saw the pieces hardly again. And they, to this day, they still clap and cheer when something works. I've never seen that when an airplane flew. Coming back in a capsule was a very undignified way to come back from space, especially for a pilot. And so we felt that if we could develop an aircraft-type vehicle, uh, the pilot could fly that back from space. Much better way to come back, in our opinion. So we decided to build a small demonstrator without asking for headquarters approval because we were a little afraid that because of the politics, they would say no. The flyers at Edwards tried out a shape that would fly without wings, called a lifting body. They pulled it behind a car. It was pretty bizarre uh, flying a very advanced spacecraft behind a Pontiac out in the middle of the desert, you know, thinking that this might lead to a new spacecraft. The official research program later took up the flyer's idea. What it wanted was a reusable spacecraft, one that could fly back to Earth when its space journey was done. Those who tested it ran great risks. The edge of the unknown is a dangerous place. always the winged airplanes, the lifting airplanes, that I could relate to. So even though I admired the people that flew the, uh, the Mercury and the Gemini and the Apollo, I, it was nothing, I, it was something that I didn't want to be a part of. And uh, I was glad when the, uh, when the shuttle came along and put wings back on the spacecraft. April the 12th, 1981. Within a lifetime, the proving ground of Kitty Hawk has become the proving ground of space. Pilots John Young and Bob Crippen put their lives on the line to show that man can go into space and fly back to Earth. Chris Cripp waiting to go fly. He doesn't look very nervous, but you can see I have a nervous smile there. I think I was as nervous as Cripp was, but I'm just so old that my, my heart wouldn't go any faster. Anybody who's not apprehensive about climbing on top of a first-time flight of a liquid hydrogen-oxygen uh, rocket ship really didn't understand the problem. And I think both Grip and I were fairly nervous. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We've gone for main engine start.
Roger roll. Roll program complete. Roger roll complete. Only 78 years after the Wright brothers launched their first fragile aeroplane, Young and Crippen are bringing an aeroplane back from space. This is re-entry. We're probably moving at Mach 18.6, and you could feel the vehicle turning right up over the water. Really tremendous. There was the Mach 10 roll reversal. This is a roll back at uh, Mach 4.8 over Bakersfield, California. The vehicle was behaving uh, very solidly. It's a beautiful handling machine. Looking very smooth, speed brake. We're coming down at 20 degrees gamma, which is about six times uh, steeper than the average airliner makes an approach. You maintain your airspeed out there at about 285 knots, equivalent airspeed. 50 feet. 40, 30, 20, 10, 5, 4. Three, two, one, touchdown. I'd have to say it was one of my best landings because I made a whole bunch of landings in T-38s right after the flight, and none of them were as good as that one. The flight was a success, but they had needed the resources and manpower of the richest economy in the world. Testing the unknown, reaching beyond the skies, has become the most expensive business on Earth. There are still new challenges, of course. Steps to take as daring as those first taken by the Wright brothers. A spacecraft that can take off from a runway, for example. NASA is already designing one called the National Aerospace Plane. Britain has another, HOTOL. In the end, only the energies and wealth of countries and corporations will get them off the ground. But there is still a place for individuals for the lone inventors who, in their garages and dreams, first launched the romance of modern aviation. This is a revolutionary new plane, built of new materials conceived by a solo visionary, the Starship. The man touched by the same vision as the Wright brothers, Bert Rutan. I had a model airplane background, and I found that, yes, indeed, it is possible to build your airplane in your garage and go out and fly it. And I somewhat stumbled on this method of moldless composite construction, not really knowing whether they would be acceptable ways to produce airplanes. I was able to produce an airplane in three months. That was the big breakthrough. From then on, I realized, my gosh, if I can build an airplane in three or four months, no reason why I can't, over a couple of years, uh, develop and test four, five, six configurations. The most significant thing was not just the stall-limiting canard aerodynamics. I think the reason that I've been called a pioneer is that in 20 years I've developed, flight tested, flown over 20 different types of airplanes. Using the composites primarily as a shortcut so that I can build a wing this week instead of taking months to tool it and weeks to build it. When Rutan created Voyager, that most remarkable of aircraft, designed to circle the world without landing or refueling, like the early pioneers, he brought the edges of the unknown and the impossible a little closer. I didn't invent a new technology or a new material for Voyager. I stuck my neck out and applied it 
without asking myself, gee, isn't that too dangerous? Or won't that maybe not work? Well, of course, it's dangerous as hell to make an airplane that if we'd have had the little bit of turbulence out of takeoff, we'd have lost the airplane and crew. And uh, if I'd have added two or 3% more weight to it, it'd have gone off the end of the runway in flames. I think the world of aviation will uh, gain from me mostly inspiration. The fact that a few people, literally in a garage or a small shop, built an airplane that doubled an absolute distance record, flew all the way around the world, flew through all this weather, and came back home safely. The fact that that was done all composite, without mixing metals, without solving all these stupid problems that the engineers make for themselves, that will provide the inspiration that, my God, it, it can be done. We're going to do it. We'll stick our necks out. I knew how the Wright brothers felt when they came upon these things and, and had success. <laughs>